And my dearly beloved in Christ, today I'd like to speak about the history of All Saints Day and All Souls Day. And there was a priest named Father Francis Weiser who's written many books on the liturgical year. On, he's got a book on Easter and Christmas and uh, different feast days throughout the year. He's got a whole book on the Holy Days of Obligation. He calls it the Holy Day Book. So I'd like to just mention some thoughts from his book. The Church of Antioch kept a commemoration of all the holy martyrs on the first Sunday after Pentecost. And from this, the Feast of All Saints began. Again, it was first honoring the martyrs. St. John Chrysostom, who served as preacher at Antioch before he became Patriarch of Constantinople, delivered annual sermons on the occasion of this festival. They were entitled, Praise to All the Holy Martyrs of the Entire World. In the course of the succeeding centuries, a feast spread throughout the whole Eastern Church, and by the 7th century was everywhere kept as a holy day of obligation. In the West, the Feast of All Holy Martyrs was introduced when Pope Boniface IV in 615 was given the ancient Roman temple, the Pantheon, by the Emperor Phocas in the year 610 and dedicated it as a church to the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the martyrs. The date of this dedication was May 13th, and on this day the feast was then held annually in Rome. 200 years later, Pope Gregory IV in 844 transferred the celebration to November 1st, as we have it today. The reason for this transfer is quite interesting, especially since some scholars have claimed that the Church assigned all saints to November 1st in order to substitute a Catholic holy day to replace the pagan Germanic celebrations of the demon cult at that time of the year. And that later translated into Halloween. Another reason for the transfer is that many pilgrims who came to Rome for the feast of the Pantheon could be fed more easily after the harvest than in the spring. Meanwhile, the practice had spread of including the memorial not only of all the martyrs, but the other saints as well. Pope Gregory III in the year 741 had already stated this when he dedicated chaplain St. Peter's in honor of Christ, Mary, and all the apostles, martyrs, confessors, and all the just and perfect servants of God whose bodies rest throughout the whole world. Upon the request of Pope Gregory IV, the Emperor Louis the Pious in the year 840 introduced the Feast of All Saints in his territories. With the consent of the bishops of Germany, France, he ordered it to be kept on November 1st in the whole empire. Finally, Pope Sixtus IV in 1484 established it as a holy day of obligation for the whole Latin church. The purpose of the feast is twofold. As the prayer of the Mass states, the merits of all the saints are venerated in common by this one celebration. Because a great number of martyrs and saints cannot be honored with a specific day because there's only 365 days and there's countless saints. So since we cannot have an individual celebration, the church says, okay, on All Saints Day, we'll honor all the saints. And then Pope Urban IV said that it's also to make up for any negligence, omission, and irreverence committed in the celebration of the saints' feast days throughout the year and that due honor may be offered to these saints. And I would just like to speak about All Souls Day. The need and duty to pray for the faithful departed has been acknowledged by the church from the very beginning. It's even recommended in Scripture in the Old Testament, the second book of Maccabees, Chapter 12, verse 46, where it says, It's a holy and wholesome thing to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from their sins. And then when Protestants rejected Scripture, they also th threw out the book of Maccabees. It's not in their Bible, the two book of Maccabees. But the church it wants public and private prayers for the poor souls in purgatory, but especially to offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass for their release. The customary dates for public services of this kind 
and you'll find this in the back of your missal. It's on the day of death and burial, the seventh and thirtieth day after death, and then the anniversary of death. And except for the funeral mass, the actual observance of these dates is not made obligatory by the church, but left to the piety of relatives and friends of the deceased. So, you know, after my mother passed away, you know, in those days, it, uh, I was having mass anyway for her, but there were special prayers that could, and you could have a mass for the dead no matter what the rank of the feast was, except some very high-ranking feasts. The memorial feast of all the faithful departed in a common celebration was begun by St. Odillo, who was the abbot of Cluny in France in 1048. He issued a decree that all the monasteries of the congregation of Cluny were annually to keep November 2nd as the day of all the departed ones. On November 1st, after Vesper, the bells of the church were tolled, and afterwards the divine office for the dead was recited. And then the next day, all the priests had to offer the Mass for the repose of the poor souls in purgatory. The observance of the Benedictines of Cluny was soon adapted by other Benedictines and then later by the Carthusians. Pope Sixtus II in 1003 approved and recommended it. It was some time, though, before the secular clergy introduced it into the various dioceses. From the 11th to the 14th century, it gradually spread spread from France, Germany, Spain, and then England, and until finally in the 14th century, Rome placed the day of the commemoration of all the faithful departed in the official books of the Western Church on November 2nd. But if November 2nd falls on a Sunday, then it's observed November 3rd. November 2nd was chosen in order to the memory of all the Holy Spirits, both of the saints in heaven and the poor souls in purgatory should celebrate on two successive days, and in this way to express the Catholic belief of the communion of saints. Since the Feast of All Saints had already been celebrated on November 1st for centuries, the memory of the faithful departed was placed on the following day. And then Pope Benedict XV in 1915 allowed all priests to say three Masses on All Souls Day in order to give increased help to the suffering souls in purgatory. There's also something interesting about that, that during the Freemasonic revolutions throughout the world, the French Revolution and the others, um, many uh, monasteries, many religious houses were destroyed, and also the records of saying Mass. So some people had many, many Masses for the poor souls said. They're called Foundation Masses. And um, so on um, All Souls Day, you'll, you'll see one of the Mass intentions is for the intentions of the Holy Father. He wants to make sure that if all the priests throughout the world are saying a Mass on that day, that they'll cover th those Masses. The Office of the Dead is recited by priests and, re and, re and religious communities. And then uh, today, there's a special indulgences available, as I said earlier, from noon today to midnight tomorrow. By saying those totius quotius indulgence, you gain a plenary indulgence, release the soul from purgatory by saying six our fathers, hail Marys and glory bees under the usual conditions. In many places, the graves in the cemeteries are blessed on the eve or the morning of All Souls Day, and a solemn service was held in the parish church. The liturgical color for November 2nd is black, and then the tabernacle veil is purple, of course. The masses are part of the group called Requiem Masses because they start with the words, Requiem Eternum Dona Eis Domini, Eternal Rest Granted to Them, O Lord. The sequence sung at the Solemn Mass on All Souls Day and other occasions is a famous poem, Dies Irae. Day of Wrath, written by the 13th century Franciscan. It's been often ascribed to Thomas of Solano, who died in 1260, the friend and biographer of St. Francis of Assisi, though the authorship is not certain. And then these are traditional observances. And this was before Vatican II. It was much more um, observed, much more universally. Numerous ancient customs associated with all saints and all souls have come down through the centuries and are still observed in many countries. 
Some of them are of strictly religious nature, such as the customs of decorating the graves and praying in the cemeteries. This practice is general in all the Catholic countries, both in Europe and America. On the afternoon of All Saints' Day, or in the morning of All Souls, the faithful visit each individual grave of relatives and friends. To visit the graves of dear ones and all souls is considered a duty of such import that many people in Europe will travel from a great distance to their hometowns on All Saints' Day to perform this obligation of love and piety. It's an ancient custom in the Catholic sections of Central Europe to ring the church bells at the approach of dusk on All Saints' Day to remind people to pray for the poor souls in purgatory. When the pealing of these bells is heard, the families gather in one room of the house, extinguish all other lights except the blessed candle kept from Candlemas Day, which is put on the table. Kneeling around it, they say the rosary for the poor souls in purgatory. Although the month of November is dedicated to the poor souls in purgatory, the church has not established any season or octave in connection with all souls. The faithful, however, have introduced their own octave. It's really the whole month of November. Devoting the eight days after all souls to special prayers, penance, and acts of charity. Before Vatican II, this custom was widespread in Central Europe. People call this particular time of the year Souls Nights or Soul Nights. Every evening, the rosary is said for the poor souls within the family while the blessed candle burns. Many go to Mass every morning. A generous portion of the meal is given to the poor each day, and the faithful abstain from dances and other public amusements out of respect for the poor souls in purgatory. This is a deeply religious practice filled with the genuine spirit of Christian charity, which overshadows and elevates the unholy customs of ancient pagan lore. In other words, Halloween. I'd just like to close with a story about the poor souls in purgatory. In the life of St. Elizabeth of Portugal, we read that after the death of her daughter Constance, she learned the pitiful state of the deceased in purgatory and the price which God exacted for her ransom. The young princess had only been married a short time to the king of Castile when a sudden death snatched her from her family and her subjects. A hermit soon after came to see St. Elizabeth and related that while he was praying in his hermitage, Queen Constance had appeared to him, entreating him to make known to her mother that she was languishing in purgatory, condemned to a long and terrible suffering, but that she would be delivered for the space of a year. The holy sacrifice of the Mass was celebrated for her every day. St. Elizabeth asked the king what he thought of it. He said, I believe it would be wise for you to attend to what has been made known to you in so extraordinary a manner. It's nothing more than a Christian duty to have Masses said for our deceased relatives. A holy priest was therefore appointed to say the Masses. At the end of the year, Constance appeared to St. Elizabeth clad in brilliant white ro a brilliant white robe. Today, dear mother, she said, I am delivered from the pains of purgatory and enter heaven. St. Elizabeth hastened to church to thank God and there she found the priest who assured her that the previous day he had finished the celebration of the 365 Masses with which he had been charged. The Holy Queen testified her gratitude by distributing abundant alms to the poor. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.